today is uh, the first of a variety of lectures we're going to be seeing on testing. This, this testing discussion is going to go through some discussion of testing processes, um, sort of test broader test tips for how to how to manage some of uh, testing for it to be most effective. But we're also going to be talking about test case design, which is sort of the bread and butter of testing needs. By bread and butter, I mean, look, you're going to have to come up with clever ideas for what to test, for scenarios to test, for situations to test, scenarios that are more than just chance to find something. And we're going to spend quite a, uh, a number of lectures on how do you pick things to test that are likely to show errors. Okay, um, And that will include discussion of uh, equivalence uh, cases, uh, so equivalence classes, um, boundary value, boundary cases, um, discussion of a little bit of uh, things like um, uh, Latin, Latin hypercubes or orthogonal rays, and we'll go to discuss um, uh, path testing. Today, however, is the first lecture of this sort, and we're going to be talking about overall testing tips and so on. Um, ones that I've collected here from personal experience, but also from a variety of uh, different sources. And one of the best sources that I uh, suggest is, um, is this, the Effective Software Testing, 50 Specific Ways to Improve Your Testing. It's a really good book. There's also some other books by the, uh, a guy by the name of Chem Kaner, K-A-N-E-R, uh, first name is C-E-M, which are highly advised as well. They have lots of good stuff on testing. Um, and if you're looking for guidance for how to do good testing, those sources are particularly good. There's also, there's also some other books I could recommend if you were to come talk with me. Um, okay, so a couple of top principles here. When working to, to engage in testing, you should be testing not only the program, but the processes that gave rise to the program. So when you're debugging, when you're removing the problems, you remove problems from the program source code for sure, but you also should be re removing problems from the process. You know, why is it that this bug wasn't caught earlier? How is it that this bug got introduced in the first place? Was it due to a miscommunication, poor documentation on issues, poor understanding of the frameworks involved on the part of some of the developers, um, uh, due to a lack of, of spike prototyping of how the certain thing would work? You should be thinking, you know, how can I do better next time? Okay, this is a, a key feature that's almost certainly going to be in the final exam. You, you use testing and debugging to test the debug processes, not just the bugs. And that will help you be, do things more efficiently. Now, I'm asking you here, requiring the use of test-driven development. So here you're creating some tests, maybe not, certainly not all the tests, but some tests prior to the code. Make the test, you make it run, you make it right. The test initially, the code should fail the test. Why will it fail the test initially? You don't, have code written. you don't have code written to deliver the functionality. All you have is a skeleton of that code. And then you make it run and pass the test. And then you do some refactoring and make it right. With the hallmark of refactoring be, being you're not changing functionality, you're instead getting it to um, deliver the functionality with higher quality. You should use a bug tracking system. I've required you to use GitHub issues. Use them early, use them often. GitHub issues, uh, I provided a link in the syllabus to a site which makes really nice use of GitHub issues, issue tracking, not just for defects, but something else. What else would you use issues to track? 
could use issues to track. Well, what? You, sorry. Features. Yeah, features. Features to be implemented. And one of the key issues with tracking is that you can assign it to someone. They could indicate the status for it. It can be accompanied with information. You could promote it through stages of its development, say for, for double checking, for peer review, et cetera. So issue tracking is of key importance. Did you folks use issue tracking with 370? Official issue tracking? Okay. Um, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's a, it's a key technology for real world uh, software development projects. Um, we talked about building for testability. Um, you're going to be wanting to think about that. Use assertions, put in locking code, have ways of, of tracing through the code with that and test hooks. Automate most tests that you do. So if you do a manual test and it proves fruitful, fruitful that is, it shows a problem, create an automated test to do it. Why would you do that? <coughs> After all, you've shown this problem. Why create a, Why spend the time creating an automated test for it? Maybe later an extra functionality will break if you just test it. Yeah, okay, good. So if it's broken now, you'll be able to rerun this test and make sure it's fixed in the first place. And as we'll talk about later, one of the most common things to happen is that something that previously worked breaks Again, it didn't work, it was fixed, it breaks again. And a test like this can be part of the regression test suite, as it's called, to watch out for things like that, okay? Um, I've said check test errors. Outputs from tests should be checked. A test should log things. It should indicate whether it succeeded or not. Double check, I mean, check those things, make sure that it not only ran, it actually passed. It actually did what it was supposed to do. I mean, this sounds obvious, but I found students not checking these things quite a bit. And these are smart students. And, you know, don't, don't get into that mode where you think, just because the test runs, we've done our job. No, it can run, that's great but it can fail and it can run and succeed and you would need to distinguish between the two, right? Yeah. Okay, create some sort of schedule what's, what's going to be tested first later. Um, okay, now there's a bit of human theater here. And I don't want to presuppose relationships here. But the fact is that testing, testers and developers often have a certain degree of tension between them. Why is that? Why would that be? Because some um, the, the developers wanted to make the program run and the testers do everything in their power to try and find something to break it. Precisely. Precisely. Testers are trying to break, trying to get the code to not run. And a developer generally would like it to run. <laughs> And sometimes they'll, fi they'll claim that testers are being unfair about testing. Y you know, you're testing a very rare case, or you're testing it with unrealistically low memory. Or, you know, I was never told it was supposed to operate offline. You know, I was never told this. It's very easy to get in a defensive position with testers, or with developers against testers. And what that means is that you got to handle that interface carefully. And one of the places you, ha you have that interface being realized is defect reports. You fill out an issue and, in, and that issue report, you want to be careful about how you write it, you know. And you don't want to write it very casually. You know, this still hasn't worked. <laughs> it's still not working or something like that. You you want to you want to make it factual and you want to make it non-barbed, okay? Um maybe it did work at some point, but it broke again due to another person's check-in. You don't you don't imply okay, it's never worked. This is totally broken or something like that. Maybe it's not totally broken. Maybe there's some 
superficial thing that's preventing it from being logged in and once it logs in it's great don't don't put too fine a point on it don't jab unnecessarily have some have some sympathy for the developers right mo yep. yeah yeah um now you should think about pair testing and and, and buddy testing um uh pair testing uh so i test your code you test mine that's a that's a great thing um in pair testing you can actually do testing side by side much like pair programming you're, you're actually coming up with ideas for how to test it more effectively okay um with builds we've talked about requiring the code is is tested with the smoke test before check-in make sure that before you check code in it's been run against the sanity test basically um and testers talk with the developers talk with them early talk with them often okay so i've talked about defect uh, tracking systems there's a whole bunch of systems out there in past years of the class we've we've given free reign so people have used jira for example or redmine or track actually i'm not sure anyone's used track recently or bugzilla that's been some years too track is do you folks use track in the department when we used it in IT. sorry I'm in, I'm in, IT. in it yeah 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 and in the department if you ask some of the tech staff to set things up the best way to do it is well, certainly one of the best ways to support it is to submit a track ticket so that's the issue tracking that our department uses but in this case i'm asking you to use github issues okay and a lot of your development should center around issue tracking there's also trello are you folks familiar with trello yeah, yeah. with cards and and it's it's a pretty nice system um in the past, some 371 teams have used that to, to, go, to really good effect. Okay, um, so some suggestions here. You wanna be thinking about your test environment. Under what environment are you gonna be running this test? Um, if you're doing React Native apps and each of you has phones, say Android phones, you don't wanna just be using it with any old phone as your standard test. It's fine to do some manual testing for that, but you'd like tests to be reproducible. And part of that is making sure it's used with the standard configuration. Online, Wi-Fi, say, rather than cell data. These things matter for speed. Maybe it's being used with a certain amount of memory, et cetera. One of the things that can help guarantee that is an emulator. But emulators do have their own costs um, associated with them in terms of speed, for example, and not being able to incorporate some aspects of real world communication, et cetera. Um, so you want to plan your test environment carefully. What, how are you going to test, test things in an automated test environment? A key component of that is being able to reset the test, the state following a test. What do I mean by that? Reset the state following a test. You've got a test environment. I'm saying you have to reset it after each test. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you're testing a certain variable and within that test you're changing, and yeah. you're checking. Good. By the end of the test, you have to reset that variable good. to what it was initially. That's great. And uh, so, so very good, Mo. That's a, that's a great example of it. But I'm going to take that much further with some of the other examples. What besides variables might a, an app modify? Um, it might add or delete um, classes. Like it might create new classes. Memory, use of memory. So it okay. can like add on memory. Okay, so there's, there's memory. Or it might add or move things from databases. Okay, there, there's what I'm looking for. Databases modify files yeah. now imagine the situation you run a test it fails or or conversely you run a test it succeeds and that test has modified some files in the process is it possible if you were to run that again immediately that it would fail yeah, yeah. 
because it's it's running it from a different baseline. It's running it from a different state, right? It's it's if it's modified something, maybe it blew the files away. Maybe it you know caused them to be empty. Maybe it screwed up something in the database. So if you want to run that test in a reproducible way, a way that you can run it again, you get the same results, which is very useful for debugging, amongst other things, or for a developer, you know, diagnosing a problem, you should really be able to reset that environment entirely. What that means is not only variables, so that's good, not only things in memory, allocating classes or whatever, that's, that's pretty standard. You have an app, you knock it out of memory, you restart it, it kind of starts de novo in terms of its memory variables. But what really needs to be attended to is things like databases and files, which you need to get back to their original state so that the test can truly be the same test, right? Um, You can be looking here to do that on a regular basis. And one of the best ways to do that is through a technology called containerization. On the other hand, if you have an emulator, an Android emulator, that can help with a certain amount, or for that matter, an iOS emulator. It can help with a certain amount of automatic resetting of the state. Why do I say that? Well, basically, it comes up with a phone in a certain known state. But what it doesn't automatically give you is resetting database, for example, that's written to externally, say over a network connection. And you're gonna wanna try to make sure it's reset to that. Um, I don't know that you'll need containerization this time, but you could think about it as a, as a possible addition um, for testing. I think it's probably not gonna be of of, of central use this semester, but in other projects it is, because containerization provides a self-contained, uh, precisely recreated uh, environment in a cheap way. Um, okay, uh, so you're gonna be wanting to think about prioritizing your testing. What do you test first, Jesse? So like, you know, what, what things do you put your emphasis on testing early, versus later. And generally, there's gonna be some criteria to do, um, to, to emphasize things early, uh, things that are high risk. Testing is all about risk management. It's all about, look, we have limited time, we've got all these risks of bugs in different areas of the system, where is that time gonna be spent most effectively? There's no way that you could exhaustively test a realistic application you're going to build. You can't possibly test it over all possible inputs, all possible user actions, all possible databases, etc. Can't be done. So you got to take your limited time and put it into intelligent testing. Testing that's more likely than not to show errors, more likely than chance, right? Um, so if you test A, often it means you can't test B. So you got to be intelligent when picking A. <laughs> because you can be rolling out other things, right? Um, and uh, here you're gonna be focusing on serious bugs. Here are some causes of risks for testing. Well, you tell me, what, what things might you consider? Okay, so you've got this program. Mm -mm. It's been provided by the developers. What things might you look to test with extra high priority? Um, things that are high risk, things that okay. um, have multiple functions. Okay, complex right. functions. Um, okay, that's good. Things with an amount of randomness to them or, or like not static because those things have more probability of having things go wrong within them. Somewhere along the way or something yeah. like that. Okay, again, it kind of gets down to, to complexity there. Right. What other things might you look at? Things that are integral to the system. Yeah, like if they go wrong, the whole system breaks. Yeah. They're particularly important, so that's good. How about other things? Connections to databases. If you're like a database program, 
Okay, so for example, um, that's where external vulnerabilities are. Things can go wrong pretty easily with a connection. What could go wrong with a connection? Could cut out. Could cut out. Could be spotty. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. Can occasionally have an error associated with it. So that's an external vulnerability, something you don't control, so it means you have to make yourself less vulnerable to it. So those, those are good things. What other things might, might incline you to think, hey, this is a part of a program to, to concentrate on? Invariance is a pretty good thing to concentrate on. Yeah, if there's a clear invariance, something you can crisply test, and like, um, if that's, you can easily test, is this true? And it will tell you a lot, is it in a sane state, right? It'll say, okay, is this, is this pretty well sane? You can get a lot of in understanding from that. You can get a lot of, under of knowledge from that. Contracts are pretty integral to... Yeah, okay. So, test against contracts. Good. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Contracts are absolutely central. You test across, uh, against the contract. Well, here's some additional things. Complexity of code is up there for sure. New parts of the design are newly implemented features, right? Why, why are those particularly valuable? Well, other stuff you may have tested before. This is new stuff. This is stuff where... It's been a lot, it hasn't had the chance to be tested before. There's not a lot of precedent here, right? New technologies incorporated. Markets is not as relevant here, but um, where someone's just learning, you know that Mo's just coming up to speed about that, you know, and that bridge software, what have you, and there's a need to, to, um, to connect with it or, or something about the network interface and, uh, you want to you want to check those things. Certain parts were rushed. You know, the last minute there was an addition to this certain area. Yeah, you might want to check on that. Um, uh, or maybe there was past bugginess of a certain in a certain area. Focus on that, right? Um, so uh, there's little unit testing. Maybe I only had a chance to, to put a very limited unit testing. So you want to do that, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so those are some causes of risk that might cause you to do some, um, some testing. Let me go back a few, few things here. Okay, right. Um, okay, you should have some test from requirements. I mentioned that before, right? You, if you got requirements, use it to drive some tests. Okay, um, beware of skimping on late, late check-ins, plan for non-functional tests. Do some planning for stress test, load test. What's the difference in stress and load testing? Um, load is for server and stress is for memory or data. Yeah. Yeah. So with a load test, you're going to be often looking at how many users can use this at the same time. If we had 100 users, would the system still function? Stress tests you're generally going to simulate it under limited memory, limited disk space, network speed. It's sort of stressing how well it works under environmental challenges. Fortunately, these days, those things can often be simulated directly. So you could do it in an emulator, right? Or you could do it by actually running some, there's certain software will make it seem like your system's out of memory, make it seem like it's low in memory, make it seem like it's got a slow network connection without actually needing to make that happen. That's really useful. Uh, okay. okay, this is an important point. Isolate the developer and test environment. What do I mean by that? Well, typically developers are power users. They're, they're, they're folks who often have fancier hardware at their disposal, maybe for the development platform, maybe for phones. And you want to make sure you're not, in, before you ship software to the bigger world, you want to be sure you don't assume that everyone has like a developer quality machine. Generally, developer machines are one or two steps above 
most people's machines. Same thing is true for phones. I mean, most people who are developers tend to enjoy technology. They're more likely to have a phone that's a recent model than an average person in the population, and maybe to push its limits because they need it to do extra things because they're using all sorts of apps or what have you. So maybe they're savvy about which phones have greatest functionality. Maybe they have a bit more money than most people. And you, wanna, you don't want to assume everyone is the same, same hardware, same, same capabilities, right? Perform manual exploratory tests. Be sure to do that. By the way, that's something that people can help out in an ad hoc way. Um, they can jump in and do some manual tests. Um, not much problem here with dev circulation. Traditional development teams, sometimes people toss the hot potato over to others and it circulates around. Um, find some testing tools. There's tools out there that will help you test your system better. And this is very important for this team as well as others. Try to freeze the code at least several days before the deliverable. Why would you do that? Why does it help to freeze the code? By the way, when I say freeze, what do I mean by freezing code? No new features. That is the key thing. What sort of code change is OK? Some refactoring would be okay. Bug fixes. Sorry, bug oh. fixes. Yeah, yeah. So this doesn't mean like hands off. I'm done. Time for Mo to go to the beach. You know, um, <laughs> uh, so instead, what it means is, you know, no new features being rolled out. Why is that important? Okay, fair enough. So, so you want to be sure you've sort of synced up. It's solid code. You've done refactoring as needed. You're not in, as they say, technical debt, where you've got you've got a lot of cruft in your code. You got to take out, and you're in a solid place. You've reached a milestone. Yeah, yeah that's that's a that's true. But why do it several days before the deadline, whether it's a class deadline or a real world deadline? Yeah, and what has to happen to have confidence it's going to work when you hand it in? Testing. testing has to be done. Not only testing, but what has to happen after the testing is done? Well, or well, okay, there's some documentation that could go on in parallel and so on. That so that's good to think about. But when the testing's, what if the testing shows a problem? Uh, yeah, and it needs to be debugged, right? And it, and often that involves developer. Testers generally not going to be able to debug things as well. Why not? Because they just test and look for the issues. They generally don't look at the code. They generally don't know the code really well. It's the dev who has to do the debugging and the fixing, typically. And that has to be done. And then it has to be stable. You have to have confidence that the fix isn't by itself broken or anything, right? So this is really important. It's also important as a matter of respect for the testers. Because if you throw it over the night before, it's an, old, it's an ugly night. <laughs> Jesse had a mysterious smile. Um, I, I think maybe past projects or something. Um, if things are tossed over to the testers late in the game, it's hard for them to do their job. And it's in the developer's interest for them to do, the develop, to do their job to catch issues, right? Okay. Um, uh, okay, so another suggestions. If you find a defect, quickly report it. Not verbally only, but also on issue tracking. Why? Why not just verbally? If Mo's right next to you, why don't you say, hey, Mo, oh, I found this. Look at that. Isn't that weird? <laughs> yeah, sometimes people forget. Yeah, sure, there's other priorities. He may say, oh, come on, he's working on his 317, something like it's that. It's also because that could be a, like, change his words in my head, bias, I guess. Like, if he said, 
If he writes it, I know exactly what the problem is. Yeah. But if he doesn't write it, I'm just going to interpret it the way I That's right. You might, you might think you understand it. You really don't. Good. What other? Other developers could also work on it. Yeah, develop, other developers could get it, sure. Maybe it's a defect that is a duplicate, rather. It's a duplicate of something already there. Um, and uh, that's something Mo already knows about. He doesn't have to go know about it, you know, learn, learn about this particular thing. Um, also, it can be tracked, right? You could track when he's taken it on, when he started to work on it, when he believes it's fixed. It lets it be tracked and it lets it be accounted for. Hey, I would love to know how many defects have been fixed. If it just whispered in Mo's ear, then it gets fixed. I don't know about it. But if it's part of the defect tracking system, I can know, okay, you know, quite a bit of work is getting done. Also, if he thinks it's fixed, how would that might be that relevant to Jesse? Uh, yeah, because really, Mo may think it's fixed, but to fully validate it, you either want the person who reported it or, or the tester to test it out. Make sure, yeah, it's really fixed. And by having it in the system, it allows for, for that to take place. Um, let's suppose there's an error. You can't see it twice. It happens. You try to reproduce it. You can't. Do report that, because maybe other people are seeing it. Maybe there's some commonality that could be found that would allow it to be reproducible. You should try to make sure that you can document errors in a way that, as I said, is non-combative. Um, and you should recognize that Testing the same issue is not necessarily duplicated work, but running exactly the same test is. So if you're doing it manually with some different steps, just making sure the database interface works or what have you from the system, the network connections are properly done. You can do that with a couple different manual tests. That's fine. Um, or different automated tests. Running the same test why it shouldn't yield any, any, uh, any differences. And remember that the person to close a bug report, to, to finally close it off, is not the developer, but the tester or the person who reported it. Okay? So really, we hope what's happening is that you know, bug fixes are going on here all through time, and then at some point, releases get made. Releases that will get let Jesse start to test, for example. And, and that will allow some bug fixes uh, that have, uh, need to be done. Further things will get fixed. And then a release three will come, et cetera. So there's a lot of work coming between these releases to testing. So a bunch of things get fixed. Boom. It's worth testing now. OK. Um, OK. Test tools. A lot of test tools out there once you total them up. I provided a list. I think this is from the Kaner book, although I'd have to check. Um, memory leak detection. That's more useful for things like C, C++. Um, tools to generate test procedures um, are out there. Uh, coverage analyzers. I've asked you to use those to analyze coverage. How, how much of the program are your tests reaching? in terms of lines of code or branches. Test data generators to generate data. GUI testing tools that will let you test it through a GUI. Tools like Water or Selenium, um, JRobot, lots of others, um, Nightwatch, etc. Um, and I mentioned uh, stress testing tools. OK. Um, OK, so buddy testing. Developer A writes tests for B's specification before B begins coding, and B does the same for A. It's good stuff, better objectivity. I'm testing your code. It can also help me critique the documentation. Um, the developer themselves who wrote that code generally tests it sympathetically. They want to show that it works. We talked about that before. 
another developer will often try to really break it more than the original developer. Um, and it can spread knowledge around because two people at least now know this code, okay? Okay, now, this is one of my strong recommendations. It's been a big success in the past. In recent years, people really like them. They're easy to do, they're very insightful. Bug parties. So the idea of a bug party is you get the team together or a subset of the team, and you basically pound on the code. You pound on the system and you compete to try to find bugs to increase the number of bugs that you found and improve coverage, code coverage, to see if we can get it to 80% or 90% from currently 60% or something like that. It's a lot of fun. It's fun even for the developers to see what weird things happen. What? That's really wild, you know? Um, you see the code, you see the code do weird things. And it's a good morale boost. There's a lot of learning about how to test effectively to get circulated. People come up with neat ideas, others jump onto them, and you can really uh, be more effective, much more effective than each person in isolation. You kind of have a sense who's working on what, and so you're not hitting the exact same things within the room. And you reward people if the most found the most bugs or the biggest bugs, or the most creative testing approach. Right, um, and uh, then you can create actual test cases that will automate things. So it turns out we're going to come back to bug party idea in a number of lectures for a key need, which is to estimate the number of undiagnosed defects out there, hidden defects, defects we haven't found yet. We're going to see how bug parties conducted in parallel, two different bug parties, can allow you to approximate the number of defects that are probably out there lurking in the program, but no one's yet found them. Okay? Another thing, hallway usability testing. The idea here is, look, get people from outside the class, bring them in, and have them try to test your system. Try to test how usable it is. See what, where they get confused. It's really insightful. Especially if you can get non-CS people. Why non-CS people? Because you get someone that is from computer science. Yeah. They're kind of inclined to not break it, usually. Because if they read, like, pre and post, just naturally, we kind of like to make things work, I think. Okay. Let's suppose they're doing... So, I, don't, I actually agree with you. Let's suppose, for the point of this, that we're going through a user interface. Okay? Oh, okay. Like we're going, we're actually getting to use it on the We also kind of sometimes think about the code behind. Like yeah. if I open a web page, yeah. I'm like, oh wow, that's pretty cool. And I know what they expect. Yeah, that's right. But we, like someone that's going to learn. like an underlying idea yeah. of how code works. Right? That's right. Yeah. If, we see a, if we see a grouping of things, we can say, oh, that was made with a list. That's right. And like we know what a list should have. It should have an add, it should have a delete. That's right. You kind of know what to expect. An average person wouldn't know anything. That's right. So you, you see a couple buttons. You say, oh, that must be the delete button. You learn to recognize, right? X means delete. You know, plus means add. No, there's a certain amount of knowledge that's built up in the general population about it. But our knowledge is, is actually often a lot deeper. Another obvious thing I find. So, you know, I help produce professional software that's sold these areas. Another thing I find is like we're very sympathetic, like Mo said, with um, using apps, uh, web apps, for example. Um, we'll go fill in a form, we'll press submit, and we're patient, right? Yeah, okay, it takes a bit of time. Maybe it takes, you know, five seconds, ten seconds. A lot of people in the population will do what? Let's close it. They'll close it or they'll press, press it again or they'll refresh. They'll keep on pressing at, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> and, and, you know, I know just in my bones as a, as a software developer, if you press it a couple times, it may break something, right? It's slower. Yeah, yeah, it gets slower. That's right. And so it's like, wait, don't touch it. You know, it'll, it'll come back. Uh, it's just doing its thing. It's probably communicating over the net. And 
people's mental models outside of computer science do not include that. We had, um, we had an app that uh, some uh, colleagues were using. Um, we had produced it in our lab. And, um, and we kept on getting these. So this was an app that was running in the background. Basically, you'd call up the phone, it would run in the background. Um, uh, the only thing you had to do is you had to start it up through pressing the icon the very first time. And after that, uh, it, would, it, it would run from then on, including in future boot up sessions and so on. And what we found is that the people who were using it were, whenever they thought about the app, I want to use that app, they'd go and they'd press the button. And so it was starting up multiple copies of it, I think, and it was causing these crashes. And we could never reproduce the crashes because we were using it the way it was supposed to be used, yeah. which is the way we knew it was supposed to be used. But people don't know that. They don't know it's supposed to, you're supposed to do this before that. You're supposed to, you know, um, you know, uh, pull down this drop down and select only one item or whatever. Um, so they end up using it in ways that we think informally we might call them weird, but it's totally non obvious to them how to use it. We do quite a bit of stuff with the Oculus. Do you know what? You know, Ocular? Yeah. 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 And once again, I mean, some of the software we create is awesome s software, but when you have people coming in, they've, they don't, they don't know where the buttons are. They don't know, you know, it makes a difference if you pull it halfway and pull it all the way, or, or you know, you should, um, you should use one in, in each hand as a hand specific one. And, and so they end up doing things that we might think are, are crazy, but, but it's actually not unreasonable for someone who has that level of knowledge. So if you drag in people from outside of CS, they're like gold, because they will not know how to use your app and they'll find weird things that, it, that can be, you know, can go wrong that you would never have thought to test because you were testing that it works, <laughs> like when it's used properly. Yeah. Even even in like if you know CS, it can you can have weird things happen. I remember of a story um, when they were making Crash Bandicoot, the PlayStation game. Yeah. They did a test because that when you would write data to a card, it wouldn't work yeah. ever. It corrupt. And the guy who made the actual animation set the hertz to an incredibly high rate. And it turned out when you jiggled the controller slightly, it would screw with the hertz rate, uh -huh. and the hardware would break. <laughs> and Sony was like, this isn't our fault, don't blame us. But it actually was. They had to remake pl PlayStation because of this weird bug between controllers and memory. Because it would fry the price. Because it would make it so you couldn't yeah. write data. Yeah, yeah, no, that was a bad thing. When I was your age, um, we had these, uh, our computers were, were on these sort of terminal things, and, and you could send messages to other terminals. Um, a bit like instant messaging in a way. But um, it was like decades before that. But um, one of the things you can send supposedly would like it would if you send it, it would fry the other terminal. So like don't don't, don't send this. This is like the message of death. You know, um, it'll it'll cause the other terminal to go into an infinite loop, which will burn out a circuit board. And um, that was happening on the iPhones a couple yeah. of years ago. If you yeah. sent uh, a like a specific text message to an iPhone, <laughs> it was shut down the iPhone for good. <coughs> yeah, and apparently it was in the code somewhere in the iOS where it was for testing purposes, and they forgot to remove that test. Are you sure? It, it was yeah. the difference between Chinese iPhones and the, the so if you worldwide send it to iPhones. Them? And the difference yeah. in the alphabets and for testing. And there was a lot of pranking where like if I send you a text, if you don't open it, you're good. But the yeah. second you open it and it goes on your screen, it just fries the phone. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. And People would be like, don't, don't open your text, don't open your emails, don't open, yeah, there was like yeah, trolls all over Yeah, that's happening with Chrome too, there's a specific link, yeah. if you sent it, you, it would crash your Chrome, and you, <laughs> like you were lucky if you could open it. I mean, the best example is like when people wait for an elevator. Yeah. Right? They don't, they click it once. <laughs> that's right. If they're in a hurry, like it's not like if you click it 3,000 times, that's going right. faster, they're just like... You never know, maybe has a priority. Yeah, that, that, that's, yeah. Like the, that's like the best example, really. Yeah, yeah. Or when like old people shout over the phone, they think right. they're going to get faster. Like, right. They're just people that are just imagining like they know what's happening, they just don't. That, that's right. So it's a, um, it's a thing where when we build software, it has to be robust to these 
lack of knowledge, right, yeah. of, 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 of how to use it. And it's not just a matter of documentation uh, alone that, that solves it. It has to be kind of done in a way that they won't do these things or will guard against it. <laughs> you know, we'll say, please be patient. This is already underway. And that's a, that requires thinking to put in. So getting people in for the so-called hallway usability testing can be really, really useful. Okay, let's talk about regressions. So regression is basically when a change breaks a feature or operation that we thought was fixed or that basically worked before. Um, and now, now it doesn't work. We thought it was fixed or it was fully working feature and now it's not working. It regressed, it went backwards. We thought we were forward for now and now we've gone back, yeah? Um, now, this sort of regression testing is really important to know about because there's often a gap between what you're currently testing for and what you would have to test for to discover all previous bugs as well, okay? Um, sometimes you're, you're not testing for things that were solved before because they're working, and why test for them? This used to be a really major issue with software development projects. These days, our builds are fast enough that we can often do the entire, we could, we could test all previous tests as well. But there may be contexts where you can't, and you gotta watch out for this, because um, you gotta watch out for these regressions. Now, part of the issue here is that Regressions are extremely common. Old code that work, so code that worked breaks, or bug fixes that are attempted for a given bug fail. And the statistics here are grim. Check these out. If you're modifying fewer than 10 statements of code, the statistics I've seen say about 50% of bug fixes work. You're trying to fix this bug. You modify a comparatively small bit of code. 50% of the time it succeeds. That's 50% of the time it doesn't succeed, right? Um, there's a regression. You think it's fixed. You count it as fixed, perhaps. You mark it as fixed in the issue tracking system, but, it's, but it doesn't work. With, if you're modifying more code, like 50, 50 statements, about 20% of bug fixes work. And there's lots of reason why they don't work, right? Um, lot, lots of reason. Now, there's two uses of regression. One have to do with these fixes that, that it actually didn't work. So you're looking that a fix actually fixed the targeted bug. And this is one of the reasons we automate testing. Because, okay, this test found a problem. You want it to be automated so you can really quickly test, is the problem fixed? You're making a tricky fix, maybe it's not fixed the first time or even the second time, but you can quickly rerun the test rather than having to do it manually, step by step by step, right? So this is one use of regression. If we talk about there being a regression, if this fix that we were working on, we, we said it was fixed, we submitted it, but it ain't fixed. It, the fix failed, the fix caused another defect or didn't work otherwise. Sobering statistics, these. But the second possibility that we call a regression is if new development breaks old features that worked. They were working earlier, and now they don't work. And often it's earlier bugs coming back. Sometimes it's just that the new development breaks assumptions that cause those old features to fail. But old bugs often reemerge. Why do they reemerge? We talked about it in a previous class a bit. Why do they reemerge? Give me a couple of reasons. 
when you fix the bug in isolation, it might be fine. But if they how those two interact might cause the bug to reappear under a similar dif or slightly different set of circumstances. Okay, um, maybe that could happen. So, so maybe the certain old bug appears when a certain value zero is used for something and you've tested it and, and you've inserted it so the value actually varies over time and you've tested it with other with values greater than zero but you didn't test it with zero and now sometimes it can be zero okay could be how about that's it's a bit abstract to think about it what's a, a reason a bug might that was fixed earlier might reemerge? you unfix it when you're trying to fix something else yeah okay you change it back you say oh shouldn't that be plus one and I said okay what's another reason usually bugs appear from complicated code yes not usually from like easy code that's right so if it's complicated there's a very high chance that if you fix it now it breaks again some other way but with the same problem yeah 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 so you can get sort of it's like a balloon you squeeze it here pops out there squeeze it there pops out here in any case, it's not getting through the algorithm. Mm -hmm. It just dies. So that's, yeah, it's complex code and it ends up causing the similar failure, maybe for a different fault. Okay, what's, uh, what's another thing? Well, we talked about earlier merge conflicts, right? How could a merge conflict lead to a reemergence of a bug? Um, a fix that was made might be deleted. Yeah, okay, it might be deleted by someone overwriting it after a merge conflict, right? right? So, so it had a fix, it worked for a short time, someone comes in and there's a merge conflict and they don't realize that that was a key fix and they overwrite it. So it's very easy for these things to, to re-emerge. Sometimes you recycle earlier code. Um, and with regressions, you got to watch for both these things. New fix actually worked under various testing conditions, and old bugs haven't reemerged. Right. Um, so here we're going to make sure with regression testing, the, the goal is to make sure the previously found and closed defects are no longer present. Defects that are reported as fixed are no longer present. So in other words, old bugs haven't come up, and that features that were working continue to work. These features that seem to work for a while, that they're going to continue to work, right? So why is that particularly important? Why is it, like, wouldn't I want a new feature to work? Why is it so important that an old feature work? If you had to weigh them on a scale, which is more important, having a new feature work or an old feature work? Having an old feature work? Why is that? Because it was working before, and it's probably more important to the system because you worked on it earlier. Okay, it's, I'd say it's more important to maybe the system, but especially to what? To users. to users. Like imagine if Google Docs, suddenly tables don't work. I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of Google Docs, hundreds of Google Docs, and quite a few of them use tables. And if suddenly tables stopped working, it's this new release of Google Doc that where tables stop working is added negative value. It's like taking away my functionality. It's taken away my ability to function in these docs. If a new feature, you know, Google Docs being able to read my document doesn't work, I'd really like that. Really like for it to be able to read my document aloud. But, but it doesn't break my existing workflow. It's just, it's not adding perhaps as much value, but it's not adding negative value. You get the distinction there? So, so, you know, with a, with a new feature, look, if it's detected by in a release candidate, it can be, you know, costly to, to delay and, and fix. Um, and uh, at the same time, if, it, if it's discovered post-release, um, you know, there's image loss. Um, some, there's, uh, there's a failure of a new feature, so some users might be disappointed. But it's not going to destroy their workflow. With an existing feature, it's often a high cost to detect. Um, 
uh, high cost in the sense that it's it takes a extra degrees of testing. You're not just testing the most recent stuff. And it can disrupt customer workflow. It causes negative value. This is a key point though, right here. I would argue that existing features that break, older features that break are often harder to fix. Why is that? Yeah, up. yeah. So for you to fix that, sure. It might break something else. Yeah, and it may be in an area of the code that people aren't very familiar with now. The new code, people, it's fresh in people's minds. It was just written. So, in terms of knowing, oh yeah, that area, yeah, okay, fine. Um, I'll I'll fix it. It's much more familiar. Whereas if it's in the bowels of the code, if it's way down there somewhere in this area. People don't remember that well. How is that supposed to work? Yeah, it was impacted by the new code, but you got to fix it down there. It's often it's harder to to know how to fix it immediately. You see that because it's it's legacy code. Often you've inherited it from two years ago, and now you've got to fix it. And the person who wrote it is left. Not fun. Okay, now. We talk about there being test escapes. A test escape is a term of art, and it means basically a defect that escapes. Escapes to whom? The user. To the user. It escapes to post-release. Now, it turns out that knowing about these are really valuable. One thing is you can fix them lower problems with quality to users, right? You lower the risk of alienation and, and so on, if you can hop on it. But it also can help you spot the process, right? Like, why didn't we catch this? How did this creep through? Is the user using an old OS? Maybe they're using an older version of Android, or maybe it only appears on Chinese phones, right? Phones with Chinese language support. Maybe it appears when you're tethering your system through a phone or you, the phone is tethered up to provide Wi-Fi access to its neighboring things. Maybe there are things we didn't think to test. And by learning from these, we add to our test suite. We start testing with additional configurations that will allow us to identify these things, right? We helps identify areas where types of defects may go unfound, right? This is really, really valuable, and you can add it to your regression test suite. So knowing about these is really valuable. What's one way to have to know about them? Suppose you have a phone app. Your phone app is being used in St. Paul's, RUH, and City Hospital. How, how might you learn about test escapes? crash reports yeah you might also have a, a user feedback session where it says you know my phone you know this is this app crashes when I try to scan a QR code on on my phone and and when they submit that it automatically gets a phone um, inventory so within Android and I believe iOS as well you can have it generate a sort of inventory of the current phone, like it, it's a profile of the phone systematically that will give like iOS version and you know release uh, version and, and how much memory is free and, and uh, uh, information on, on the, uh, the number of apps installed or whatever. So you could get that information, you could try to find out what's going on, maybe get some contact information for the person. You can find out. Okay, now what is what is this thing we call beta testing? What is beta testing? Testing a version before the final release. Okay, by whom? How is it different from the testing that's going to go on your group or the testing goes? And who are those users? 
in the external world. Yeah, normally they're users in the external world who are often volunteers, right? Now, beta testing is a really interesting process because it's done by real world people who have real world needs often. But, but sometimes they're using it more out of novelty than need. They just want to, hey, see what's coming, see what's there see what some of these new features are they've heard about. And the truth is, it's often more of a marketing than a testing activity. It's like you're getting out buzz about your product, um, letting people see neat things, upstaging competition, maybe letting partners build atop your system who want to build third-party apps on top of it or to interface with it. And you want early public reviews you know, on CNET or whatever. It is great in terms of getting marketing, but my point is that often you don't get good quality test reports. It's not just like testing for free. You know, like we don't need testers internally, we'll just put out a beta test and it'll be fine. And there's a couple of reasons for it. A couple of reasons why it doesn't provide nearly as, not, as much value as testing by professional testers. Typically, it's non-representative. They're more power users. They don't use the product heavily. They're not going to be using it for their core workflow often, rather sometimes for novelty. The fact is that often they're busy and they're not going to give you really good feedback. They're not going to give you very detailed feedback because they're not getting paid for this. They're not getting anything that valuable out of it. and they might not want to spend the time providing detailed information. You might be able to collect it automatically, auto, auto test reports posted back automatically. That's like gold. But in terms of getting them to actually comment on it, it's very limited, um, you know, to, to actually give a detailed description of what's going on. So they often don't report bugs or it's lower quality bug reports. And often you can't really ascertain like how much if they used without some instrumentation. Okay, so once again, a key point of learning, and we'll finish here. Try to learn when you find bugs, how to improve the process, how the defect came about, how the process could be changed to avoid it in the future, and how you could find it faster. And this includes sharpening the testing skills to improve the speed of diagnosis, hypothesis checking, working with others to find it quicker. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you, I know Jesse, you wanted to talk with me and I'd be glad to talk with others uh, now for office hours. Thanks very much.